Thank you. Well, first, just to say I'm really honoured that you would have me to speak to you because we're all teachers and having taught for, I'm in my <coughs> 35th year of teaching, um, I know how much effort and energy it is to, to sort of put it, spread our wings and, and find out new things. So I'm so honoured that you would join me for some time so I can share some stories about this incredible laboratory that I work in because it's a sort of laboratory of education. And I'm gonna try and do that by using the Kalahari Desert, flatbreads, you know, those amazing breads you get with Italian soup and with a cardboard polar bear and Eskimos. So I'm gonna try and explain that way because if we model what we do with each other on how we'd like to be with young people, then we should be prepared to emotionally connect with authenticity with each other. So although this is about education, it's actually, it's a really a story that I'm weaving for you, which comes from my heart. Um, it's, it's based in neurophysiology. It's based in the way that young people work and tick. But more than anything, it's a story to share with you about how I found myself unlearning so many things about education and relearning in a democratic school. And I am a teacher like the rest of you. I'm also a school leader. I was elected to be what's called nominal head teacher. So I'm the head teacher of the school, even though we don't really have a head teacher because our school meeting is the head. It has all the power that would normally be held by governors and by the staff body or the leadership team that is our school meeting. And that school meeting is the head teacher. And it's made up of 65, 70 children and 20 adults. And that's a decision making body of the school. But they asked me to be the person who would represent the story of the school on the world stage. So that's what I do. But every day I teach history and I teach psychology and I teach cooking and I do sport with kids we go and play outside and I go swimming in the river with them. That's really what I do. And I've been doing that for 35 years. And it hasn't changed. I've changed. I can't swim as far. And I can't walk as far with the kids on Dartmoor. But I actually do exactly the same that I did with them when I was 26. And I'm now nearly 60. Yeah. And I still love it. And I'm sure that resonates with lots of you is that we're doing this because we love children. That's at the heart of it. And I want to see children evolve and grow to flourish. And the reason I'm involved in democratic schooling is because I think it's a place where children really do flourish. And now I tell these stories in Korea and in Bangladesh and in India and in Israel and in Russia and in China. And I found the confidence in the last decade to tell the story of this strange laboratory. And it's so tiny. It's a little school tucked away in the middle of Devon in a little town. And yet it has this really big story to tell about what happens when you trust children. And there is a growing body of research globally that if you're involved, and let's not call it democratic, Let's call it listening schools. If you're involved in a school that listens to children, something really amazing happens in terms of how children flourish. And I wanna share some of those stories. And the most important thing for me, I think, is that democratic schools celebrate the now, where we are now, where the child is today, and also allows a child to be prepared to flourish for the future. And I think a lot of the schools that we work in, what they tend to do is say that school is only preparation for a happy life later, for a successful career, for university. So it's all about preparation for later. And there's something really amazing about a school that celebrates the now with children. How to be the best nine-year-old you can be and how to be the best 13-year-old you can be and believing that when you are that perfect version of yourself, you become an amazing 25 year old. University becomes possible. It isn't all about preparation for later. 
that's a very reductionist model in which school is really only relevant and you only flourish in school and the very successful children i was one of those children that was very very successful in in, in school and it took a total failure and a piece of luck to transform my life because I was one of those very acquisitive children who was very good at school, did really well in exams. And the reason I did really well in exams was I was frightened to fail and I wanted approval. And that's what conventional school, and I went to a very good grammar school, like a, not private, but a top grammar school. And then I went to Cambridge University. And when I arrived, I realized I didn't know anything which was a bit of a shock for a really successful A-grade student. I knew nothing. I couldn't find the library because I wasn't interested in finding the library. I could find coffee shops. I could find places to talk to beautiful humans, but I wasn't interested in learning because I actually realized I didn't know how to learn. I just knew how to absorb and regurgitate. And so I failed dramatically and it was the first time in my life I'd failed and I was really frightened of how it made me feel and I changed from history because I was a very unsuccessful history student my essays would come back with as much red on the top as I'd written in black I was a disaster and I changed to archaeology and anthropology which was really designed for sports jocks and people who weren't really very clever generalists who would be good rowers and generally okay. So I, I really, I ran away from being unsuccessful because school had taught me only how to be successful. And I dropped so many of my passions in order to be good at exams. And when I get to university, I realized it hasn't prepared me at all. All those years, and I find myself by myself pretty incapable and then there was a bit of luck. I accidentally walked into a lecture theater and because I'm English and I'm very, very polite, I didn't walk out because you don't do that sort of thing. You just make yourself invisible and sit down in the dark and you carry on listening. So complete luck. I was too shy to leave. That's how poorly I'd been prepared for life by my school. I didn't even know how to stand up for myself and leave a room. So I sat. Oh my God, I loved it. This guy was an expert on the Canadian Eskimo, on the Indians of North Canada. And I was utterly enthralled by his storytelling, utterly. And it was the, f and then we got to the end of the lecture. I loved it and I left. And the next day I came back and I realized that was, Apart from giving up history, this was the first choice I'd really made. It was a big choice. I went back to follow something that fed my passion and my heart. And I went to every lecture and I read every book he'd ever written. I spent my Easter snuggled up in my bed reading Lewis Binford. So passion led to excellence and led to expertise not a fear of failure. I didn't mind if I failed anymore. I just wanted to know more and I wanted to know more. So I get to my end of my university career and I realized that at last choice matters to me. That I'd spent my life in this reductionist model where everything was reduced to an exam and a grade. And now I'd found learning. So an accident and failure had liberated my mind and it felt totally liberating. And that is something which, when you're in a democratic school, you see that happen. You see a child's mind switch on. So it's a bit like listening to pop music, which is anesthetic, and listening to classical music, which wakes up the whole mind. And when a child comes into your room out of choice, and is ready to fail and is ready to take a risk, their whole brain lights up 
their whole personality walks into the room. And it's really hard to explain the difference because children look like that in ordinary schools. I behaved like that in an ordinary school. No one would ever guess that I wasn't properly present for most of my school career. I was only fully present when I was deeply, truly interested as myself. Then I trained to be a teacher, mainly because I wanted to carry on rowing. And a really good university for that uh, did teach a training course. So I trained to be a teacher. I didn't know I was gonna be a teacher. I knew I liked communication. What I realized when I was doing my teacher training was children kept getting in the way of my lessons. They were brilliant lessons. If only the kids hadn't been there, it would have been so good. Yeah, they constantly interfered with how brilliant I was. Things like not being interested, being hungry, being distracted, noticing their girlfriend across the room. All these things got in the way of my amazing lessons. So frustrating. And because I was too lazy to apply for a job, someone found me a job at the most radical school in the UK, which was called Dartington Hall School. And I worked there for two years. And as I walked into that school, I saw children who were fully possessed of their own personalities. They didn't look up to see who I was, they just carried on. 13 year olds invited me over and said, oh, come and sit with us, what's your name? They were fully self-possessed. They didn't feel guilty that they weren't in class. They were sure about themselves. It was very, very disturbing to be with 13 year olds who were more evolved than I was. I mean, dramatically. In their bodies, in their personalities, having amazing conversations because democratic schools are really also about communication. If you go into a deeply democratic school, talking is happening everywhere. And it just isn't the teachers who are talking. It's everyone's talking. On sofas, in corridors, on stairs, in classrooms, they're all talking about fascinating things and they're playing amazing music. You know you're in a democratic school when someone's playing Led Zeppelin or Bob Marley. You just know it. Yeah, it's like, it's like our anthem is 1960s, 70s rock and reggae is like the anthem for democratic schools, the gentle revolution. Now, a year into that new job, which someone had found for me, because that's how useless I was, someone had to find me a job in a radical school. The school closed. We were told it was going to close in 12 months because of two tragic deaths. There'd been a young, young girl had drowned in a river and a young boy died on a motorbike uh, around a, a woodland, he died. And the press was really, really aggressive and toxic, which of course it should be really critical of these tragedies. And the school had to close because students just wouldn't come. But we had 14 children with us who I'd been teaching for a year and it, and it surprised me how much I cared. And they said, this has been our school for our whole lives. You can't, you can't let it happen. And we said, well, we can't stop it because we're not in charge. And they said, well, make it stop. We said, well, we'll start a school with you if you'd like. We could design a school together. And because we'll all be in charge, it will never close because it will be up to us. That's another really important part of democratic education is the management is the school. It doesn't matter how few children there are. We just took smaller wages. It doesn't matter how difficult it gets. We just stayed. We promised that we wouldn't let it close. And I promised to an amazing guy who was about my age when we started it. I promised him I wouldn't let it close. So I was 26 full of utter bullshit, but I made a promise that I wouldn't let it close. And we designed a school together, 14 children in a garden. And these are some of the things they asked for, which still exist. Because if you ask children what school should look like, they will tell you. And they wanted exams. 
guess what? They wanted exams. They wanted to prove to the rest of the world that they were really clever. They're not idiots, right? It isn't that they said, can we just buy loads of sweets and just hang out in the trees all day? No, they said, it's really important that we have really good teachers because we want these exams. We want to choose which exams we sit, but we want exams taught well. We also want everyone on first name terms. We said as staff, we'd all like to be on the same pay. That's what democracy can mean, and equality financially and in terms of communication and power. No petty rules. A petty rule is like, your tie is the wrong height. You should button your shirt up here, Sean. And, and we said, well, okay, tell us why. And one of the girls said, when I was in my other school, going into a psychology class, the teacher told me that my tie was the wrong height. And then when we got in the class, this teacher said, I'd now like you to tell me about a dream you had last night. And you know what I thought? I'm not sharing my dream with someone who's worried about the height of my tie. So petty rules get in the way of communication. And if democratic schools are about talking, we need to make sure nothing gets in the way of our relationship. They also wanted choice and they wanted risk because we all feel alive when we take risks. So that means they also wanted to be allowed to fail and feel okay about failure and play. And one of the things they said was really important was doing nothing. It's really hard to build into school curriculum, nothing. You can't really write a timetable that says nothing, but if you trust the children and you don't make them feel guilty, they will spend quite a lot of time doing nothing. Nothing that adults think is nothing. Yeah, like sitting, talking about childbirth and boyfriends and politics and sex, you know, all that nothing stuff that they just do when you're not teaching them. It'll happen all the time. And they might even ask you to come and sit with them and talk about childbirth, politics and sex. And it'll be a much better lesson than the lesson you were going to give them on politics, childbirth and sex on your terms when you were ready and they weren't. One of the best conversations I ever had about childbirth was when three kids were sitting on a sofa and they said at nine o'clock in the morning, we are not moving from the sofa all day. I said, fine, would you like a blanket because it's cold? And they, yeah, that'd be great. And can I make you a cup of tea? And they said, yeah. And then about four hours later when I'd been teaching, doing brilliant lessons, which the children just kept getting in the way of because they were brilliant until the kids turned up. I sat with them and we talked about childbirth. And the questions they asked were more deep and more powerful than if I'd tried to do a lesson on childbirth as a guy, as a dad. I spoke as a dad about how it felt to be a partner watching my wife give birth. And the questions they asked were amazing because they were ready. And democratic schools are about education when you're ready, not when the teacher's ready. You can still turn up and take the chance that a Sean class will be really good. But they're almost like time off. In some ways, the class is where you go when you're not totally sure your own journey or you've chosen to have a journey with me. So. We build this design for a school. And at the heart of it was something which I think is really important, which is something called relevance. It's relevant because if the children are designing it with you, it will be relevant to them. And so I want to show a first slide. And I like to think about if I was in the Kalahari Desert with the Bushmen, the Yikung, what would be relevant education to them? I want to show you a slide. It's got two beautiful slides. Stolen from Getty Images, of course. Yeah, so I'm sure I'm breaking copyright. Um, but this is relevant. This incredibly wise old woman 
is sharing wisdom with the child and it's relevant. An ostrich egg with water is going to be stored somewhere for when she goes through the desert to find food. I think we, okay, so I just picked up some bit of translation there. So for her, the education is always relevant. It's about the things she needs to flourish. She's learning from the elders. She's definitely not doing algebra. Nor is she studying books which are irrelevant to her. And these young boys are learning about tracks in the sand from an elder because it's relevant. It's what they need to flourish and survive. Now, if we were to ask ourselves the same question of school, so when you're teaching in your schools, how much of it is relevant in terms of a child flourishing? Yes, I know we're preparing them really well for exams. I get it, right? I'm great at doing that. My kids get really good grades. When I ask myself how much of this is relevant, I have to sometimes struggle. So then I redesign my lesson as if I'm in the Kalahari. So I put into my lessons an awareness of what the children need to flourish. So the lesson then becomes the medium for the exchange of the tracks, the ostrich eggs, the equivalent of making a bow. They're the 21st century life skills that I build into my classes because it's totally essential that we have this relevance. And in a democratic school, for the teachers, what you have is also trust and freedom to design your lessons in order that the children who come to them flourish. That's an amazing feeling when you trust your colleagues to be creative and design without control from line managers, because we are accountable to the children. In a democratic school, the children are your best critics and your colleagues who might come and watch you. And the children, I, I stop in the middle of a class and say, tell me how this is going. What's working, what isn't? And they tell me, and at the end they tell me what's worked. So I get a chance to get better. And I say, is there anything in that that was relevant? And they'll pick out things like, well, the way you've got us to work together in a team. That was really relevant, but we really get it, Sean, that learning about the Battle of the Little Bighorn in 1876 isn't very relevant, but understanding the way we got to that battle, we understand the human psychology of the people involved. We can apply that. So democratic schools I encourage you to use your subject as a way to apply skills for flourishing outside your class while still making what was happening in the class relevant. So if I show you this little slide, these are the 12 21st century skills. So these are the Kalahari skills. These are the ostrich eggs. These are the tracks that you understand. These are understanding where to find the roots. These are our fundamental 21st century skills. And my understanding has been working at SANS that these things we can deliver in a really creative, beautiful way within our classes and within the culture of the school. A school meeting, everyone present listening to each other, critical thinking happening, collaboration, communication, yeah? Flexibility of how do you adjust your mind to cope with someone's argument? How do you stand up as an 11 year old and learn how to hold the space with leadership? Yeah. So if we think about a democratic school, we have the opportunity to design with those deep skills. And I'm gonna try and share some examples. And the first is going to be through a tiny video of the girls who join me and boys, there's 12 kids out of 17 join me to cook every week.
and cooking for school lunch to feed 60 people. And I just need to find my, my video. Let's see if I've got it, this one here. I might need to just download it and play it for you. Here we go. Now, uh, have we got it on screen, guys? Are we good? Not yet. Ah, okay, it might just be loading. I'll just stop the share and I think it's just loading for you. Yeah, it is. Give it a moment. Okay, I'll set the scene. We're cooking lunch for 60 people. It's real, it's relevant. What are all the skills that are going to come out of that real world job? I don't usually think about my cooking in this way, but I could see, and maybe you will see similar, cooperation, collaboration. I saw leadership because some people had to take charge of incredibly dangerous things like super hot pans. And we're talking about like burn you badly. We had a deadline to stick to one o'clock. Food has to be good. If food's bad, they tell us. So there's a real wonderful excitement of real, real production. We're developing new skills and knowledge. I'm teaching them things which are totally essential for what we're doing for the now, but they can also take them into their lives. We're communicating, we're flexible, we're showing initiative. Let's see if we've got it out. Ah, okay. Oh, I know why. Sorry, it isn't. Well, I think it is relevant because Abba's amazing and I didn't share the sound. We must, you've got to listen to Abba. Okay, one more time with Abba. So much more exciting and interesting and real because this is what it feels like in the kitchen. 120 flatbread rolls, 12 litres of red pepper roasted carrot soup, a crumble custard all to be prepared in three hours and there's something really amazing about doing real work so joyfulness relevance doing something really important together isn't this what education should feel like yeah that they did face failure if it wasn't right i said you can't serve that one it wasn't as if i'm being gentle with them i'm being real and i'm turning it into a really great learning experience and so that's another thing about our democratic schools is that community is at the heart of it so cooking for each other cooking for the elders looking after little children knowing who struggles with food making vegan alternatives for children really thinking about compassion and empathy while having this vital, vibrant, energetic way of teaching. We can do that because we want to make a community where real things happen, like we clean the building every day all together. There are no cleaners. We clean the school together. We clean toilets. The children learn how to wash up, get on their hands and knees and scrub. We all do it. I model it every single day. I make sure that people see that it matters as much to me as to anyone. Again, the community, the relationship to the heart of that. So I'm gonna just give you one more example. Um, then I think we should open it up for exploring some ideas together. If we look at this, um, model of the 21st century student which i think is utterly intriguing which is i like the way this is divided up yeah that you have foundational knowledge which is what most schools teach yeah they teach knowledge to know things but in democratic schools, we have this celebration of the meta-knowledge, 
creativity, innovation, problem solving. Communication collaboration is at the heart of it. And then this humanistic knowledge, which I just shared with you with things like cooking, life job skills, cleaning, cooking, ethical emotional awareness at the heart of our problem solving, our school meetings, our school councils, and cultural competence, understanding the culture you exist within, finding compassion and empathy in order to survive and flourish. Now, these are equally important in a democratic school, the foundational, the humanistic and the meta knowledge. And I really like the idea that we don't have to work very hard in a democratic schools for those three to balance each other very beautifully. And they balance themselves in this young girl's story. This is Lily Bernuda on her polar bear. She's going to show foundational, meta and humanistic knowledge because she wants to raise awareness of Arctic ice collapse. She wants to try and raise awareness of the imminent destruction of the polar bear. She finds out everything she can find out about the numbers, the ice sheets that are disappearing, the problems in Alaska, the problems in Greenland. She becomes incredibly knowledgeable. She comes and asks because she's fascinated to know more. And then she says, I want to do something real to raise awareness. I want to build a life-size polar bear. So she goes to find the skilled people who can help her build a life-size polar bear. And for three months, she researches and she builds a polar bear and she doesn't go to class because she's doing class. She's building a polar bear. She's working out the anatomy of it. She's problem solving how to make this. This is only built in cardboard with a very fine wooden frame inside it. And it's layer upon layer of papier mache, really. And then it's painted. And then she organizes an event where she gathers 300 people to follow this polar bear to the middle of a wilderness. And she puts it on the top of a hill in the wilderness and she brings the press and she brings parents and families. And she raises awareness through this combination of foundational meta and humanistic knowledge where she has to negotiate not being in class. She has to face criticism and challenge from her friends. Why aren't you doing maths, Lily? Because this matters more. She has the freedom to do that in a democratic school because we realize that everything is of equal value. Playing, on a swing, doing maths, being in a meeting or building a polar bear go hand in hand with the concept of the democracy of knowledge. That gives you an enormous resource to draw upon if you want to bring democratic practice into your thinking. There we go. Polar bears, Kalahari desert, flatbreads and Eskimos. Um, yeah, so there's my story. Um, I'm still totally passionate about it. Um, I don't know how long I'll carry on teaching, but um, I don't really want to die in front of the children in a lesson. That would just be insensitive. Yeah. Although amazing piece of trauma psychology, wouldn't it? Here's some real life experience of trauma psychology, guys. How to overcome grief with Sean as he collapses and dies at the board. And I can say just before I die, I knew they'd ruin this lesson. I just knew it. There it goes. So thank you for being a uh, you know, wonderful audience, listeners, uh, but really the questions matter more than anything. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Very good combination of all the uh, things in your talk. Uh, if somebody has questions, you can write or you can just raise hand. Mm. But maybe I will bring the question from the first part uh, today. We're actually discussing and a um, few teachers had this question that, uh, mm, uh, you know, we're starting this project and maybe just now in, I know the children uh, are like maybe 14, 15, and they're just now uh, 
are uh, in this uh, democratic education trying to understand what it's about. And they were maybe for eight years in another system before. And it's quite hard, you know, for them to switch and just like, oh, really, adults care and uh, adults listen and all these things. And I know that sand school is, uh, it's not elementary school. So uh, no. children are coming from other schools. Maybe you can uh, a bit tell about this topic. Yeah. So this transition between conventional, ordinary schools. Yeah. And I think it's, it again varies from child to child. Some children have been in very wonderful primary schools where actually teachers are doing things quite similar. Lots of project work, lots of relationship, lots of play, lots of freedom. There are primary schools which realize that that is the way to be with young children. It doesn't mean that we're not interested in them getting really good at things, of course. But children want to get really good at things anyway. It's just usually that school gets in the way. Um, so we have children coming at 11 and they very quickly adjust. In fact, what tends to happen is the way it works when you come at 11 is you think you're in the world's best sweet shop. Right? Well, I can choose. That's amazing. I'll choose to do everything. And they do. They come and do everything. And they play on the swing at break and they have toast in the morning and they're like perfect pupils for about three days. And then they go, oh, you really can choose. And you go, no, you really can choose. You go, oh, well, if I really can choose, then goodbye. And they spend all day in the climbing wall. Because everyone needs to test the truth of this idea. Well, is it real? No, it's really real. And at 11, you can take lots of risks with not doing any maths and being in a climbing wall. Of course you can. Yeah. I probably wouldn't avoid maths for four years. That might be a mistake. Might not be. But I would say to someone, um, you haven't done any maths for three months. Is there a reason? And they usually say, I hate maths because the teacher was horrible. Because people don't usually hate maths because numbers are quite fun. They usually hate teachers. So we get the 11 year olds, what they do is they deconstruct the truth. Is it real? Can I choose? And they are much more adept at navigating their way through the things they love doing, being with their friends and being very playful. It's much less of a problem. When you come at 14, and Charlie might be able to bear me out on this, you come at 14, you are cynical right school was shit probably otherwise you'd still be there yeah so these are often refugees from a system that has broken them so the first thing that has to happen is healing now if we see it in this way rather than choice if we were to see it as a form of healing that you come and you have space to do what I did at university at Cambridge, to unlearn. The reason I do things to please others, not to please myself, because I want to do well, not because I'm passionate. I'm just passionate at not being bad. What happens is you deconstruct this story in your head, this narrative. And for those people, it can take a really long time. Three months, six months. And what they will tend to do is go to the teachers with whom they have the best relationship or the subject with which they had the best relationship in their other school because they still love it. So I think if you have 14 and 15 year olds coming into democratic schools, see the process as a process of rehabilitation of the learner because they have to let go of schooling to become a learner. And I think if you have that in your mind, that patience and time, if your teachers are good and you have good relationship, the children will come. They will also be very busy doing their own thing, yeah. sitting on a stair talking about psychology, or they could come to my class and do psychology. Why is mine better? 
The reason they would come to me is because I tell them that I am I have expertise that they might want to share with me. I make it really clear what I offer. But you could read the same book I read and just be as good as I am. So you have to just be honest for them about this learning environment is learning everywhere. And I think having in your minds the concept that a 14 year old is probably going to have to do some healing and unlearning before they can relearn, probably important. So your, your colleagues have to watch, build relationship and talk a lot because you have to hold on to the trust that your timing is right. When a child is really scared of maths, sometimes you need to take them by the hand and sit with them in the maths lesson. If you leave it, they'll never, ever go. The trauma is so bad, they'll never go back. So you might just have to go, this is too long now. Can I take you to the maths class and show you how beautiful Nathan is, how safe you'll feel and how fun maths is? That's also what we do as teachers, isn't it? We don't just rely on the universe to do it. We use our relationship skills to bring the child to learning. Is that a helpful answer? Mm, yeah. Uh, Ingrida is uh, raising hand and actually we're short of time, but uh, I don't know, Ingrida, did you have a question or? Yes, <clears throat> I had a question about the pandemic. I'm not sure if I'm, we still have time to ask, so. If you can answer like in one minute, we can. <laughs> John can answer in one minute and then we'll. Yeah, of course. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so the question is that at the moment kids are feeling lots of pressure due to that due to pandemic mm -hmm. schools are closed and they keep hearing that they have to catch up catch up catch up walking in summer so what are your school's positions you that due to pandemic and how you face with this problem what you do yeah to help kids so the first thing that when i heard this this phrase to catch up it sounded like they were describing a race um, and someone else has put the finishing line somewhere and I don't like the idea that children are involved in a race. Yeah. And you can't really be behind in your own race because this is each child's journey. So I think fundamentally that's a very negative way of thinking about it. If the children have learnt other amazing things during lockdown. But what's also true is because of technical inequality, because of cultural and family inequality, some children haven't moved forward the way they might have if they'd been with amazing teachers. That's true. Now that's just a description. You'd have, you'd have done so much more psychology if you'd been with me, because I would make it so exciting. That's true. What else have you been doing in, those, in that year that we should celebrate? Because you're not behind you, you're behind somebody else's race. And I don't think we should encourage children to run other people's races.